Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about Chapter 4, which is all about socialization and the construction of reality. When we think about socialization, something for us to think about is that socialization is the process by which individuals internalize the values, beliefs, and norms of a given society and learn to function as a member of society. Socialization begins very early. Some say even before the baby comes out of utero. For instance, what usually happens when the parents find out whether the baby is going to be a boy or a girl? In some instances and situations, they have a gender reveal party. So even before the baby is born, there is socialization that occurs. The concept of socialization is useful for understanding how people become functioning members of society, yet it can't explain everything about a person's development and personality. Biology is a very important component. It's a combination of biology and social interactions that make up what we think of as human nature. Before we dive into the theories of socialization, there's a couple of things that we need to think about. For today, we're going to be focusing on theories from Charles Horton Cooley, George Herbert Mead, and Eric Erickson. These are three theorists who can help to explain how people develop across their lifetime, but most specifically in these cases, we're going to be focusing on the impact of socialization in childhood and how that impacts adulthood. First, let's start with Charles Horton Cooley. Charles Horton Cooley theorized that the self emerges from our ability to assume the point of view of others and imagine how those others see us. This is termed as the looking glass self. So in short, we like getting positive responses from people, so we try to replicate our actions when the responses we receive are positive. We use others as essentially a mirror. For example, when we style our hair and we look in the mirror, we wait for the person looking back to say, that looks good. And then we determine that we like our style. In sociological terms, this self is defined as the individual identity of a person as perceived by that same person. Next, we'll talk about George Herbert Mead. He developed a theory about how the social self develops over the course of childhood. Typically, Infants only know the I, the I being the one sense of agency, action, and power. So it's all about them. Through social interaction, they learn about me and the other. The me is the self as a distant object to perceived, excuse me, to be perceived by others and the I. Finally, they develop a concept of what is known as the generalized other. The generalized other is an internalized sense of the total expectations of others in a variety of settings, regardless of whether we've encountered those people or places before. So as they develop this concept of the generalized other, it allows them to apply norms and behaviors learned in specific situations to new situations. So again, infants only really know about I. It's about them, their own sense of agency, action, and power. As they become socialized and engage in socialization, they start to step away from the I to see me. This is themselves as a distant object to be perceived by others. And eventually, they develop the generalized other, which allows them to take the behaviors based on the feedback that they have received and the perception of the, of the acceptance or, or non-acceptance of this feedback from others and engage their thoughts and behaviors with a variety of different people, places, and things. Mead also stressed the importance of imitation, play, and games. He believed that these things helped children recognize one another, distinguish between self and the other, and grasp the idea that others can have multiple roles. Then we move on to Eric Erickson. He established a theory of psychosocial development that identifies eight stages that spans a person's lifetime. Because in Erickson's views, unlike Mead and Cooley, he believed that 
as people, we don't stop developing in childhood, that we have these social forces and social experiences that continue to shape one's psyche throughout their lifetime. So from birth to death, there is psychosocial development. And Erickson believed that each stage involved a specific conflict that the person must resolve in order to move on successfully to the next stage. Here we have listed Eric's, Eric Erickson's eight stages of psychosocial development. And as you will see in each column, that they are coincide with each other. The first column reading from left to right is the age at which the conflict occurs. The second column is the actual conflict itself. The third column, once they have resolved the conflict at this age range, that this is the virtue that they will develop. And the fourth column talks about how you can see this in older age. I want to give you an opportunity, if you can pause the video, to read over the eight stages of psychosocial development. When we think about socialization, we have to remember that we aren't just socialized by anything or things, that we are socialized by pretty much everything. One of the things that we are focusing on in this chapter with socialization are the agents of socialization. Families, school, peers, and total institutions are all important socializing agents or environments. A total institution is an institution in which one is totally immersed and that controls all the basics of day-to-day -day life. This could include things like the military and prison. Each of these agents of socialization, they all have different impacts on us depending on where we are in the lifespan. For example, the family is very influential for young children but older children and adults are heavily influenced by their peers. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this later. When we talk about adult socialization, this simply means that these are the ways in which people are socialized as adults. Adult socialization occurs in situations like when you take on a new job and have to learn the ropes or when you become a parent. Resocialization is the process by which one's social values beliefs and norms are challenged and perhaps reformulated in response to spending a significant amount of time in a very different environment. Resocialization is more drastic than regular adult socialization and involves a more dramatic change where you learn a new way of thinking and behaving because you are in a new environment. This can include if you relocate to a foreign country and have to learn a new language, new customs, new tradition, new values, and new beliefs. When I think of social interaction, I think of Robert Merton. Robert Merton talks about the role theory, and Merton's role theory provides a way to describe our social interactions. A lot of the key concepts that he covers are going to be covered in the next couple of slides. So Merton's role theory talks about status. Status is the position in a society that comes with a set of expectations. And ascribed status is one that we are born with that is unlikely to change. For example, our race or our national origin. And achieved status is one that we have earned through individual efforts or that is imposed by others. An achieved status could be a professional position like a manager or a CEO of a company. A person's master status is a status that seems to override all others and affects all other statuses that they possess. Oftentimes, you'll hear a person being called out by their master status. For instance, you may hear people talking about, quote unquote, that black man. In that example, the description black came before describing the person as a man. Black is likely to be the master status. You'll also hear things like that disabled individual or that stupid kid. The first word is usually the master status. It tends to be the status that people notice above all others. Roles are the behaviors that are expected from a particular status. 
Role conflict occurs when the roles associated with one status clash with the roles associated with a different status. Role conflict typically happens when a person has two different roles to perform and they conflict with one another. For example, if you are a parent and a student, you might have class today and your child might have to stay home to do virtual learning at the same time. You have to choose between your two roles because they conflict with one another. You can't be at, in class and helping your child at home with virtual learning at the same time. With role strain, this occurs when roles associated with a single status clash. With role strain, you have only one role which conflicts with itself. For example, you're a student, so you know you're supposed to study tonight. However, there's also a party. Maybe your roommates or your family or your friends pressure you to go to the party because that's what college students are supposed to do. So you have to choose because a single role as being a college student is putting you in two different directions. We also have gender roles. These are a set of behavioral norms associated primarily with males or females in a given social group or system. Gender theorists argue that gender roles can be more powerful and influential than other roles that people fill. I mentioned previously, as soon as a baby is born, we start socializing them into specific roles. Something to think about is that depending on the sex assigned at birth, we associate that often with gender and people start socializing the child as a result. The most common is blue for boys and pink for girls. Let's finally look at the social construction of reality. When we think about the social construction of reality, we are essentially thinking about how people give meaning or value to ideas or objects through social interaction. The social construction of reality is an ongoing process that's embedded in our everyday interactions. For example, suppose you're walking down the street and you witness a woman slapping a man in public. What are the possible meanings of that situation? Depending on how hard the slap is, it could be a fight, it could be spousal abuse, it could be a joke or some type of greeting. It could be that he just passed out and she's hoping to revive him. Another possibility is that the participants could be actors shooting a scene in the film. So the social construction is really based on not only how we've been socialized, but how we give meaning or value to social interactions. Each of these definitions that I just talked about leads to a different set of potential consequences. You might intervene, you might call the police, you might stand by and laugh, you might ignore them, you can summon paramedics or ask for an autograph depending on which meaning you act upon. Each definition of the situation lends itself to a different approach and the consequences are significant. Symbolic interactionism. This is a micro level, level theory that's based on the idea that people act in accordance with shared meanings, orientations, and assumptions. When we think about symbolic interactionism, part of this micro level theory is that these shared meanings all create symbols. And while we might not have the same interpretation of each symbol, there are similar interpretations that can all come together and can help us to explain what is going on for the individual and how the individual may connect with others who share these similar experiences and assumptions related to those experiences. Irvin Goffman has a theory called dramaturgical theory and this views social life as a type of a theatrical performance in which we're all actors on a metaphysical stage with roles, scripts, costumes, and sets. Think of it from this perspective. We all know that we act a certain way depending on the context. In a job interview, we put our best foot forward. When we're at a family dinner, we watch our language. So Goffman suggests that every interaction we are a part of works this way, that we're always aware of our performance. We also need to talk about ethnomethodology. Ethnomethodology is an approach to studying human interaction that focus on the ways in which we make sense of our world, convey this understanding to others, and produce a mutually shared 
social order. Harold Garfinkel developed a method for studying social interactions called breaching experiments. This involved having collaborators exhibit quote-unquote abnormal or atypical behaviors in social interactions in order to see how people would react. Garfinkel suggested that there are unwritten rules in place in society and the best way to figure out how important those rules are are to break them. If you get a very harsh reaction from bystanders, you know that the rule must be fairly important. If people don't notice or don't pay too much attention, you know that the rule that you broke is not highly valued by that group. The internet. This has created new types of social interactions that don't incorporate verbal and visual cues that people are accustomed to or relying on. It's also changed society by creating new types of crimes and new ways of communicating. Let's think of this for a second. Relationships used to be based mainly on physical proximity. This is called territorial relationships. But we're now as likely to form non-territorial relationships based on common interests and access to technology that keep people together even when they're physically apart. Using technologies like digital video webcams and services like Zoom or FaceTime or numbers that you can call in to conference a large number of people, they can interact with each other outside of physical space. Because our reality is socially constructed, an unexpected change in that reality can be upsetting, frustrating, or simply incomprehensible. We have to take a stake in maintaining consensus of shared meanings so that our society can continue to function smoothly. And we often do this by conforming to social norms. The final thing I want to end this chapter with is talking about roommates with benefits. Our author of the textbook, Conley, points out that the decreasing randomness of roommate pairings in college dorms as students increasingly opt to be paired with students they know or who are similar to them. Conley discusses that sometimes social and political differences between roommates can be a good thing, resulting in roommates having positive effects on each other. But the opposite is true as well, that sometimes social and political differences between roommates can be a not positive or negative thing resulting in roommates having negative effects on each other, so much so that it causes conflict and tension, and others are now involved within that relationship, and it may cause the relationship to sever and one or both roommates leaving. And we're going to talk more about how we are connected with others when we look at Chapter 5. I hope that this was helpful for you today. As always, if you have any questions, questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to email me. Also, don't forget, in the description box below is a question that you can answer to get extra credit, one point added to your final grade. Make sure that you take a copy of the comment that you leave under this video and that you attach it to me in the assignment for the week under YouTube Extra Credit. Until next time, I hope everyone has a great day.